Welcome back to the UniMinds Festival. Uh, this slot is dedicated to the open innovation opportunities. We have three exciting speakers presenting us the challenges of their companies. Uh, what are the solutions they are looking for? Well, let me first invite our first speaker, Mr. Austin Kozman. Austin is the Director of Research and Development External Innovation at PepsiCo. The company is a global leader in food and beverage sector, and their product portfolio comprises of 23 brands, which are enjoyed by consumers in more than 200 countries all over the world. The most known in our region are Pepsi and Lay's Chips. Austin, the word is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, since time is short, I'm gonna share my screen uh, and walk you through some of PepsiCo's R&D needs. Uh, broken them into sort of our main buckets. The first one is around process and equipment. The first one you can see there is process digitization. And that's really looking at whether it's sensors or controls, things to make our equipment more efficient, improve quality. Sometimes it's a new sensor to measure something that we're not able to study currently. Could be acrylamide, could be texture of, of potato chips, could be uh, low flavor concentration in beverages. The next is around novel, and I would say it's food and beverage manufacturing processes. We're always looking for new capabilities that create differentiated consumer experiences on, on the back end. And sometimes those are manufacturing processes from other industries like extrusion where we used to make snack food today that was first used in, in plastic extrusion as well. So sometimes uh, you can leverage other processes outside food and beverage to manufacture in a starch matrices, a, a new and an improved food product. The next one is really around food safety and quality testing. A lot of that is still either manually done, uh, the organoleptics of, of the product using human testers as well as for some of the allergen and, and contaminant detection on food safety, you still have to plate the sample and you have to, to grow to actually look at microbial uh, content. So we'd like to be able to do something in situ uh, and, and much more quick and, and inexpensive. The next is a fertile ground really for food and beverage. It's been used a lot in, in pharmaceuticals, but now it's starting to become more popular in food and beverage. And that's really what we call biotransformation. So looking at other ways besides just thermal and mechanical changes in our food and beverage, getting into enzymatic fermentation, even chemical synthesis, can you make again, unique and differentiated products? And the final area really under equipment is all our retail equipment. So when you think of going into a convenience store or restaurant, some of those dispensers and coolers and vending machines for our uh, beverage products, as well as our, our food products. Again, looking at new ways to engage consumers. The next bucket is really around ingredients and, and flavors. And, and the first item we have there is our permissibility. So as regulatory restrictions change around the globe and just consumer trends change, we're always looking to uh, reduce our sugar, salt, and, and saturated fat in our food and beverages, but at the same time, keeping the same overall consumer experience so there's a no compromise uh, for the, the end consumer. And, and that also brings me to the next point, which is flavor technologies, you know, ways to, to mitigate some of those off flavors, but also drive new and, and exciting flavors for our consumers. Uh, we know flavor is one of the, the key levers in, in driving differentiation and, and preference from consumers. I think one area we've seen coming and heightened out of the pandemic is consumers' interest in functional ingredients in their food and beverage, looking for their overall health and wellness and their food and beverage uh, to play in that overall holistic environment. So looking at functional ingredients, and for us, it's backed by science and, and clinical data to demonstrate efficacy where uh, besides just getting refreshment and enjoyment, you can also get some functional benefits from the food and beverage. Again, one of the emerging consumer trends is, is getting away from more of the long ingredient labels and getting into more simplistic labels. So we're always looking for natural, moving away from artificial preservatives, artificial sweeteners, artificial colors, things, things of that nature. Uh, so we're looking for natural 
variants of those that produce the same stability and quality of performance. And finally, we, as you mentioned, Lay's, we, we do a lot with potato chips, uh, but also looking at different substrates, especially local ingredients, uh, getting into other legumes, pulses, things of that nature. For packaging and material, you may have may or may not have seen some of our ambitious goals for sustainability and, and packaging plays a big role in our greenhouse gas and, and plastic reduction. So we're looking at new biodegradable materials, but also for innovations in existing uh, bio-based and biodegradable polymers. So changes in the, the resin chemistry that really allows scalability and, and brings the cost closer to parity of the uh, petroleum-based products. We're also looking for methods of advance or chemical recycling. We know mechanical recycling uh, rates vary around the globe, but eventually there's not gonna be enough recycled PET and recycled uh, polypropylene for our flex bags to meet all our demands. So we're looking at enhanced recycling method that can broaden that recycling stream. Part of, part of enhancing the biodegradability is also the other things besides uh, and the recyclability of our material, and we have a goal to get to 100%, is also looking at our moisture barrier and our, our gas barrier in both our PET beverage products as well as our polypropylene flexible films for foods. Increasing that barrier uh, allows us to use less plastic at the same time, it has to be either recyclable or uh, compostable to, to, to grade. And, and finally, the last one under packaging is, is around enhancing the consumer experience as you look at different technologies and different packaging design, whether it's bringing in augmented reality, uh, even some things with different RFIDs and things like that. Can you make a new engaging consumer experience with digital printing and, and some of those technologies that are advancing? The next bucket is really around our agriculture as well as other sustainable technologies. PepsiCo is a little unique in our supply chain. We do grow in many instances our own crops. Some we buy uh, off the commodity market, but where we have a competitive advantage, we, we have our own farms. And in those farms, uh, we're looking for improvement in regenerative agricultural practices, as well as practices in general that help us reduce uh, water usage, not only on the farm, but getting into our plants as well uh, to try and get to as little water impact uh, on the local ecosystem as, as possible. For greenhouse gas, I already mentioned uh, looking at some of our scope three reduction, working with our materials suppliers, but we're also looking for GHG reduction at our own production facilities uh, and, and energy production. And, and so looking at things like uh, recovering heat off our oven and, and fryer exhaust stacks and using that in other parts uh, of the system. And finally, I, I think from a sustainability and manufacturing standpoint, it's anything we can look at to reduce uh, energy and, and water use, but also speed and efficiency. Uh, so if we're able to make the same amount of product at a, at a more efficient consumption of energy, that, that's a benefit as well. And some of that factors into zero waste. So uh, whether it's potato peels or orange peels or oat holes, some of our agricultural waste, how can we use that in a circular economy and derive value from that and feed those back into our, our feed streams. Finally, on sort of the, the last bucket around digital transformation is with the digitization, we already talked about sensors and, and uh, some of the stuff we're looking at with advanced visions and, and things of that. But we're also looking at any other type of technology where we can get into traceability and provenance of, of some of our supply, as well as really looking at how we do consumer insights and product insights and, and automated sensory and, and feedback to again, digitize the, the back end. So I know that's a lot. Uh, I'll just close with, uh, and there's more detail that we can share after this, but uh, you can either email me or you can go to our open innovation site. If you have an idea or, or a technology that you believe could be of use to PepsiCo, please submit it to the address shown here and, and we'll reply as fast as we can. Thank you for your time.
Thank you very much, Austin. Well, you have taken away my first question <laughs> uh, because I wanted to ask you, uh, you I, I believe you will not be able to wait until 4.30 uh, Central European time for the R2B meeting. So my question was, how can our researchers get in touch with you? So of course, we will now know email or the uh, open innovation platform of PepsiCo. Um, but I would like to um, invite you to stay till the end of this session because we will uh, uh, for sure have some questions and perhaps also one some for you. So please um, uh, stay until the end of this session when for the R2B. And for now, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Our second speaker is Janes Bernik. Uh, Janes is a strategic partner at the pharmaceutical company Roche. Uh, we are quite familiar with Roche. Um, and he will present three challenges that have been identified as key uh, in more than 10, uh, in 10 countries. Uh, so three regional challenges related to uh, better living and healthier living. Uh, but in more detail, I leave it to you, Janes. The word is yours. Thank you, Simona, and thank you for having me here today. So in the next couple of minutes, I will shortly present how uh, do we in Rush see open innovation, and I will also present a very concrete initiative that is addressing this uh, topic. So I assume that most of you do know Rush, but uh, still I will explain some key facts about the company. So Rush is a world leading healthcare company within 125 years in innovation. Uh, providing meaningful value and sustainable solutions to societies around the world. Um, and this is just one of the reasons why we are the highest investor into research and development around diagnostics and pharmaceuticals. So uh, Rush is a company that fully embraces innovation. And this is also the reason why we are so interested to see how we can better partnership with the startups and also other innovation hubs. As a global company, we are focused on being a strong partner for the healthcare ecosystem. And we do this in order to achieve better outcomes for more patients worldwide. In fact, uh, we envisioned uh, a new world where personalized healthcare solutions are available for the patients based on their genomic profile and where we can provide highly targeted treatments. And all this supported by high quality, real-time health data. And to achieve uh, the best outcomes for the patients, we realize that this requires substantial innovation in our healthcare systems. Um, if we would like to achieve this vision, we need to work closely with uh, different stakeholders. Collaboration with innovative startups and academia is of course part of that story. Um, so I will share my screen and um, tell you a bit more about the concrete example that we are running here. Okay, yeah. So this is the intro, and this is the that are the country that where we are running the uh, where we are running the program this year. Um, so the. In the next uh, six months, we will be running an international acceleration program for early stage digital health ventures in the Southeast um, uh, and Southern Europe. As you can see, we are launching the program in 16 countries this year. And um, the, we are running this program in close collaboration with EIT Health. The program will combine workshops uh, for the participants, one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions, along with networking and matching events. And maybe the most interesting slide would be this. Um, so this year, we will be focusing on three key strategic challenges where we see room for collaboration and innovation. Um, so the main problem, so the first challenge will be healthcare data management for better decision-making. So what is, does this mean? Uh, the main problem here is that healthcare data is mostly unstructured. IT systems are disconnected and data collection processes are inefficient. 
These are all the reasons uh, that currently most of the healthcare data is unusable for data-driven and personalized decision-making in healthcare. Secondly, uh, screening and early diagnostics. Um, as you all know, patients seek healthcare often too late and proper diagnosis can take too long. So all that leads to the poor healthcare outcomes. And the third one uh, would be the digital therapeutics and disease management. Uh, patients and providers have limited time, resources and information how to manage and personalize the disease treatment, um, especially beyond the care received in the hospitals. So that are the key challenges that we are addressing in the program this year. And what are we offering actually uh, to the companies who will be applying for the program. Uh, first of all, we are taking here an equity-free approach. Uh, secondly, program is a great opportunity for lead generation and piloting with program partners. So not only with Raj, but also with EIT Health and the, their partners. Um, maybe one of the most valuable benefits is that we are offering validation of the solutions from international industry experts and business leaders. And uh, being part of this program is also a great opportunity to scale up your business. Um, part of the program is also matchmaking. So we will do our best uh, to match the companies who are joining the program with the venture capital investors from the region. And at the end of the program, of course, we will offer a cash prize to the best uh, solutions. And what is maybe even more important, we would like to establish long-term business partnerships with the best startups and the winners of the program. So this is very in short. Um, here is a program timeline. Uh, there are only three very important um, dates to remember. So we are actually ending the collection of the application uh, at the end of November. Uh, beginning of December, we will uh, choose the, the best companies. Uh, early next year, we are starting with the active mentoring program. And somewhere end of March, beginning of April, um, we will have a demo day. So this is like a short presentation of concrete example how um, open innovation in Rush can look like. There are, of course, some others that are happening uh, in peril, maybe in some other regions and so on. And if you would like to have, uh, if you'd like to find more information, please visit the dedicated website, or you can also get in touch directly with me. So this is from my side. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Janis. Uh, perhaps a quick first question is, uh, you mentioned that you're seeking companies. What about researchers with potential solutions? Uh, I think that I somewhere read that uh, you are also interested in research that would uh, have, would, would, that will be uh, able to be implemented to the market in about five years. Is this correct? Yeah, that, that's definitely correct. Here I just presented one very concrete example how, let's say, early uh, ventures can uh, get in contact or develop better relations with the uh, corporation as Rush is. But definitely there are some other programs uh, that are maybe more open uh, for the researchers. And uh, Simona, as you mentioned, all of that is very correct. And uh, if you have some concrete examples, please get in touch and we will connect you with the relevant persons uh, within the rush. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, well, I think that uh, you will be able to stay till uh, the R2B meetings, am I correct? So yeah, that's uh, correct. If, yes, yes. So I suppose when, if there will be additional questions from researchers, they can, um, they can uh, connect, you, uh, connect with you later on. Uh, thank you, Janis, for now. Please, you also are kindly invited to stay till the end of this session. And now we are coming to the third presenter. Um, Michael Gurin, uh, he is a co-founder and active manager, investor uh, in sustainable, renewable and advanced material technologies uh, in the company Cognitech. He's situated in Chicago area in United States. 
And Michael, we are really keen on hearing what kind of uh, collaboration is possible with your company. Uh, the word is yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so as mentioned, um, we're a company that actually invests quite early in terms of technology and we're focused really in the transformation of biomass um, into useful products. Um, and so our needs are really twofold. Um, one is we need the world from PepsiCo and Roche um, to adopt, um, you know, circular economy. And I think these are particularly, or in my experience or exposure, uh, Pepsi, PepsiCo is doing an incredible job of that. Um, so the more companies that actually adopt the circular economy philosophy uh, will certainly help uh, not just us, but, but everybody in the industry. Um, um, as I mentioned, in terms of we're focused uh, very much in terms of the biomass fractionation part. Um, and what that means is that we have invested in core technologies um, that actually are able to take what's called generation two biomass, um, which is agriculture waste or forest product waste um, or crops that are intentionally grown um, to not compete with food and to separate it out into the constituent parts, um, whether it be cellulose, lignin, um, or sugars. Um, then the following step is that there can be additional uh, component segmentation um, of that where individual um, molecules um, can be um, separated. And then finally, um, those products can be transformed um, into quote unquote finished products. And when I mean finished products, this is still probably um, before such, you know, a PepsiCo or something of that sort would use. Um, but the conversion of sugars, for example, through, through fermentation into um, their feedstocks that can be used for, for example, in terms of bioreinable biodegradable polymers, um, as an example. Um, in terms of from an open innovation perspective, and I'm speaking much larger than Cognitech's perspective, um, the, the entire ecosystem here actually needs to work um, in order for the circular economy to be truly competitive um, without subsidies to the um, existing fossil fuel industry. You know, the fossil fuel industry has done the refinery model for many, many, many decades. Um, and they've really perfected the ability to take their feedstock, which is crude oil, and use every single component. Um, that needs to be repeated in the circular economy um, as well. Um, so very, very similar model in terms of uh, biorefinery. Um, and so that starts with um, the sourcing of biomass. Um, as PepsiCo had mentioned, there's some times where there's competitive advantage for them to actually get involved really, really early. Um, so Cognitech also, though we're a much smaller company, uh, we certainly identify some of the critical technologies in actually the biomass growth uh, that can then lead to um, better processes and more process conversions. Uh, but from an open innovation perspective and circular economy, um, the whole sourcing side um, is very, very critical uh, to having the right product. Um, you know, in addition to that, uh, from a circular economy perspective, um, and any large scale projects, uh, they require strategic partnerships. So um, a fancy word for saying if you build a plant, uh, you need to know where it's going to sell. Um, and many of these plants are, you know, large scale capital investments, they could be a few hundred million dollars. Um, and therefore, um, partnering up with uh, companies that can actually take the product, uh, whether it be a product that's going to be very geared towards the finished product, uh, or whether that product is actually an intermediary product, um, offtake agreements and things of that sort are very, very critical. Um, and in our business and business model, uh, which we fundamentally believe very, very strongly in strategic partnerships, uh, we're always looking for technical marketing partnerships, um, whether it be um, at the university, which is actually what started uh, the conversation um, that we're having today, um, on a specific technology or whether it's be very marketing focused where the combined technologies can actually lead to high product differentiation um, and in many cases very disruptive um, in a positive way in results. Um, you know, our, our key focus areas 
with respect to you know product or product sales are first um, in terms of the conversion of biomass to to biofuels. Um, there are byproducts associated with that. Um, one of the main byproducts is lignin, uh, but secondarily also on cellulose. Um, and those byproducts, um, as I spoke before, in terms of the biorefinery side, um, the, the more value that you can use with those byproducts, then it makes the whole economic model um, positive. I'm um, looking beyond um, Cognitech. There's, of course, a lot of discussion about transformation to green hydrogen. Um, and some of the byproducts that I'm talking about can also be used in that capacity. Um, I'm going to go through the slide very, very quickly. Um, but basically what it's really setting up is the, the fact that, that there's lots of inputs uh, that actually can be processed in the system to actually help in the concept of circular economy. Um, and that's, um, you know, energy that could be used for the transformation processes, um, green waste, forest product waste, agricultural waste, um, all of those help make the circular economy better. Um, and then on the outbound, these are just some examples, um, including some examples that we have with strategic partners um, that allow us to move from the biomass conversion <clears throat> into higher value products. Um, and again, as noted, the more value that there is for especially the byproducts, then it actually makes everything more competitive. Um, some very specific examples um, could be in terms of biodegradable biopolymers. Um, we recently licensed a technology from Florida State um, University in, um, in Florida, of course, um, where they have a lignin to uh, biodegradable biorenewable polymer. Um, so 100% biodegradable, very, very, very cost effective. Um, and it utilizes lignin, which is, again, one of the byproducts associated with making biofuels. Um, that's just one example of, of, of many. Um, just to provide a little bit more context, um, again, this is way beyond in terms of Cognitech's context, um, but this just gives you some examples with respect to the start of the biomass growing um, all the way through to the final conversion. So to take one of the streams, for example, uh, you have biomass, uh, part of the fraction can be cellulose, the cellulose can be reduced down to sugars. Um, those sugars can be either fermented, um, whether it be, you know, filamentous fungi, whether it be bacteria, um, or those sugars can actually be consumed by microalgae. Um, in some cases, um, that those, those, um, those processes can actually create components that can go into fish meal or antioxidants or proteins or essential oils, um, and then further processing um, could potentially even end up, again, to use a very specific example, not to pick on them, uh, but could ultimately end up, um, you know, as a food ingredient that goes into um, the PepsiCo product. Um, if you follow the different stream of the biomass to lignin, um, the lignin can be made into polymers. Those polymers can be used, um, again, to use a great example of PepsiCo, those polymers could be used for the packaging that actually goes um, into some of the final products for, for delivery. So these are just examples um, with respect to, you know, circular economy. Um, again, you know, our, our heavy uh, focus and investment is really in the second step, the fractionation step. Um, but we are starting to make investments that are upstream um, by very, very specific um, biomass that will give us competitive advantage. Um, and, um, and then we do have partners, um, you know, in the conversion step, um, but we are, we are all about strategic partners. Um, circular economy requires everybody to be on board, whether it be with Cognitech, uh, which would be wonderful, um, but, you know, really highly encourage people to participate, um, in the circular economy philosophy. Um, it is the only way for us to get to the point where, um, true cost competitiveness with the fossil fuel industry can take place um, and create a better world. That's really it. Thank you very much uh, also to you, Michael. Um, you, are, you are going to be staying till the R2B meeting session. Uh, so uh, we kindly invite our listeners to um, uh, to meet uh, Michael or even afterwards. 
And now, since we have some time uh, still, uh, yes, I would like to um, uh, start the questions and answers. So uh, I have two questions, but uh, we already have one from the audience and um, they are asking, can you maybe share even more successful examples, outcomes of strategic partnerships? I suppose this is uh, the question for you, Michael. Um, yes, no, ex exactly. I mean, um, you know, I spoke at the one example. Um, so we, um, we do a lot of work on innovation. So we do have, um, you know, significant for a small scale a company relative to the company is that that spoke. Um, we have a fairly rich um, IP portfolio internally, um, but we absolutely believe um, in partnership. Um, and, um, and again, as I noted, uh, you know, what actually started this conversation was a discussion about a specific technology, uh, you know, at your university. Uh, we, we have in licensed uh, across the board in terms of technologies from different academic institutions in the United States. Uh, we have a collaboration uh, with the university in Australia um, and we're, we're in the process of licensing technology from one of the national labs in the Department of Energy. So that's one example in terms of partnership. Um, we have in the area of biofuels we're on the biomass transformation process. Uh, we're working with one of the largest oil and gas companies um, in, um, in Canada. Um, so that's another you know, aspect uh, of it. And we certainly welcome um, you know, strategic partnerships, particularly as we look at the technology we recently licensed um, on the lignin biodegradable biorenewable polymer. Um, you know, we certainly welcome partnerships there. Um, that can represent companies that are involved in actually making polymers, or it could be continuing by picking on PepsiCo. Um, it could be um, actually, you know, working with a company like PepsiCo, learning what the specifications are, and then, for example, combining uh, PepsiCo and a potentially, you know, um, a, a Salve or a Dow or somebody of that sort and using that to actually drive the process. What I do know is the feedstocks that we have um, can virtually immediately um, be very, very cost competitive. So we're not talking about things that have premiums, um, but um, as I noted, these are large scale projects ultimately on the commercialization um, and they require, um, you know, in many cases, offtake agreements. Um, so that the whole process can start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, I have got information that the question is for all three. So I would also like uh, Janes and Austin um, sure. and ask both of you to uh, share your point of view, your, your experiences. Yeah, definitely. We try and search for those mutually beneficial partnerships like Michael mentioned, and, and we've run a gambit across the different partner type. So we do quick pilots with startups and sometimes uh, it may be an equity and minority stake, uh, but traditionally we're looking to be a, a customer with universities. We in license, but we also out license as well. And we even co-locate at, at some universities and, and do joint development and joint research. And even with strategic suppliers and, and larger multinational companies, I think it's finding that mutually beneficial area where you can have that synergistic research where the collaborative input of both R&D departments solves a problem that has benefit to both uh, both partners. That's that's the type of programs we try and we aspire to, to find. And we have many examples of commercializing with multiple different partners, whether it's a university uh, startup or, or you know an SME. Thank you, Johannes. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of actually examples uh, how researchers and the different startups are working together with Rush. As you all know, development of new medicines and diagnostics approach is usually tightly correlating with, you know, working with on clinical studies and so on. And it's impossible to execute all that without researchers on, on the field. Um, there is also a mechanism called uh, investigator-initiated in, investigator studies. So uh, where 
uh, if, of course, uh, it's something aligned with the strategy strategy of Raj, uh, we can support uh, specific um, research questions and programs uh, that are initiated um, from the side of researchers. Uh, in terms of working together with uh, uh, startups, um, I can mention just two that are on my mind right now. One is, let's say, Picnic Health. Uh, it's a startup uh, in the space of real world data. Uh, so how to get health data more structured. And the second can be, let's say, Kaiku Health. Uh, they are working on the remote patient monitoring and we designed with them a um, clinical study called Origama. Um, so there are many cases like that, uh, but just to, to mention that are maybe going also in a di direction of challenges that I was mentioning uh, before in my presentation. Thank you very much. So uh, perhaps a question for um, Austin and for Yanis. Uh, what about intellectual property? I suppose when you are searching for some sort of solutions and uh, Austin, in your case, I have found that um, you are also um, dedicating some sort of, uh, of budget for, uh, for a certain uh, potential solution. How, then you, how do you manage IP? when it comes to open innovation collaboration. So who owns it? Um, is it yours from beginning or do you, agree, uh, do you um, talk about uh, the proportions and so forth? Yeah, it's a great question and, and it can be a stumbling block for, for some open innovation programs. I, I think we try and be very transparent and, and open. And it, it really, there's not a one size fits all model. It depends on what the program is and, and also, what the background IP of both parties are, are, are bringing, right? Uh, so with sponsored research at universities, typically uh, we prefer to own the IP. We don't, we don't have to actually be uh, the assignee and own the IP, but we want exclusive uh, access in our field of use. Now we're fine using it, you know, if it helps Giannis in pharmaceuticals, right? That's non-competitive to us and we're open to, we don't need to own the world. We just don't want to work with you for, three to four years to develop something new and then you take it to one of our competitors. That's that's our big, uh, what we're trying to prevent. I think on with startups and things of that nature, typically there's a lot of background IP. And again, we can license that to be able to practice the new co-developed joint IP. And, and traditionally in our joint developments, it's co-owned. Again, uh, I can think of one JDA we executed recently we own the application in food and beverage but this particular company is an ingredient company and they own the ingredient and they can sell it to other uh non-competitors for a certain period of time and then it's and then the we lose our exclusivity so there's contractual ways to make it mutually beneficial our 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 goal is always to be the partner of choice and we ultimately want our partner to be successful too because if our partner is not financially successful long term uh that doesn't help pepsico yeah. Austin very nicely elaborated, you know, what are the models, um, but maybe the bottom line is it's always case by case. So it's very hard to give like a general answer to that. Um, but the models that Austin just explained are, I mean, they're similar, what the Rush is using in the collaborations like that. Uh I also uh, invite the participants to post questions into the chat section. Uh, but for now, um, I still have one. I am uh, quite noisy, uh, not noisy, um, um, catty like a person. I like to know a lot of things. So, um, what would be the perfect cooperation partner for your companies? I know it's a really awful question, but uh, in terms of uh, stage of development, for example, um, experiences, openness, uh, openness to your feedback and an additional um, development in that terms. Uh, this is the, where the question I would like to pose in that, I would like to pose the, the question in that direction. And can I start with you, Michael? Sure, I might as well just continue this theme. Um, Austin's company would actually be perfect in a university such as yours. Um, the, 
I mean, as I said, in terms of um, in the circular economy and specifically in terms of biomass processing, um, you have multiple components that actually come out. Um, some are very, very core and are easily converted, um, you know, into biofuels. Uh, there's two components um, specifically um, if you can actually optimize for the full system as opposed to just biofuels, <clears throat> you know, you use cellulose um, for value add product and not for biofuels. I mean, at the end of the day, our goal is that that you don't burn anything, right? I think that's what the world is moving towards. Um, and so what that actually means is that anything that was biomass uh, that grows very, very quickly, that sequesters CO2 very, very quickly relative to um, certainly energy crops or things of that sort, much, much faster than forest products, which can take you know, 10, 15, 25, 30 years uh, you know, before you have paper. Uh, but if you know if you're optimized, if I optimize for the next generation, right? You take that biomass, you fractionate it, you get sugars. The sugars would be fermented into alternative proteins. Um, food companies know what to do with that. Um, those same sugars can be used on much much smaller scale by even pharmaceuticals uh, for creating products. Um, if you take the cellulose pathway, the cellulose can go towards uh, textiles. We have a strategic partnership with the company that's converting cellulose into dissolved pulp. Uh, but that same cellulose can be used um, as microcrystalline cellulose, MCC, which can be used in food products, which can be used in pharmaceuticals. Um, and then, as I already mentioned, um, you know, the lignin can be used for wide range of applications, the antioxidants, which I didn't mention, but it can be used for biorenewable polymers. Um, and those biorenewable polymers can be used to actually package, um, you know, be part of the, the, the delivery system for, for both other co-companies presenting today. Um, obviously from a volume perspective, um, there's, a, there's a pretty significant mismatch. Um, and so biofuels is a massive, massive industry. And so you really need large scale um, to actually move the needle on the byproducts themselves. Thank you very much. Um, Austin, Yanis. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, as far as different technology scale, we work with partners that are very early, you know, maybe it's even just a, an idea. It hasn't even been reduced to practice yet to all the way to development ready and, and very high TRL. So I think it depends. Uh, obviously, with universities, it typically tends to be earlier stage. Uh, and sometimes those technologies take three to five years to commercialize. As far as partners, we're looking for someone, you know, that is also intellectually curious, because sometimes we're reaching out to other industries that are like, why is PepsiCo contacting me? Uh, why is a food and beverage company contacting me? And, and a lot of our challenges, if you look at it from an agnostic standpoint, we try and make it industry agnostic. So like one of our challenges is uniformly coating our snack products. But if, if you take it instead of a seasoning challenge and look at uniformly coating part, powder and particles on a substrate, then it has applications into pharmaceuticals, automotive, semiconductor, things like that. I, I think my counsel to partners, uh, especially startups, is when they work with PepsiCo can be somewhat, you know, some of the, we are not as nimble a, as they are. And so it can be sometimes frustrating. So I ask them to be patient with us because uh, sometimes it takes us a while to make decisions. But at the same time, I want them to be myopically focused on what they do best. Sometimes as a startup, you can say yes to everything because you don't want to upset a, a partner. And really we're coming to them because they have a subject matter expertise that we don't have in our core capability. And we want to really develop and hone that competency. And, and so with some of our startups, the partnerships like Danimer on the biodegradable film, they're quite public. I think that's what made it work well is they were very good at one thing and we were able to you know, bring them into our accelerator and, and bring some industrial advantage as well. And it was beneficial to both companies. So it's really trying to find that mutually beneficial partnership. Thank you. And Yanis? Um, yeah, it's a very hard question, I would say. Uh, as you know, Rush is uh, it's the only company, big pharma company, who is owning also the diagnostic department. And beside the diagnostic department, uh, lately we are focusing a lot also on the health data 
management and digital health. So pharmaceutical diagnostic and um, digital health are three like big buckets where we would like to cooperate and uh, find the partners uh, who are working with us on the challenges. Uh, so how early? Um, usually, to be honest, uh, Rush is looking for uh, solutions that are a bit more developed, let's say, when we are talking about the co cooperation with the companies. But uh, initiatives as Healthcare Lab, and maybe I can mention also Rocks Health. There is also a startup Cryosphere, which is focusing more on diagnostics. Uh, that are the programs uh, where we are looking for the partners uh, that are very early stages. So seed, pre-seed even uh, for the startups. Uh, so actually there is a opportunity to cooperate with the start with the rush on all levels um, but it's very hard to to answer that uh, question like so generally so this is okay. thank you but you, your your answer was uh, really good although the question was really hard so thank you to all of you uh, i think you've given a really nice insight into the um, development strategies of your companies. So um, I, for sure, we will get back to all of you uh, with additional questions or re connections with our researchers. Uh, again, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you also to, uh, to participants for listening. Um, before closing this session, I'd just like to invite the participants to join us the next session at, uh, in about less than 15 minutes, connecting with business gurus, how to build the science-based startups and remain a researcher. It is still, it is a really nice topic uh, for all those who are going to, who would like to have um, uh, their research uh, applied to the market, but still remain a researcher. So there are, there are possibilities also for that. Uh, thank you again to all of you. Uh, you were rock stars and see you later. Thank you, have a great day.